I'm so excited about this conversation because I can take the I can take the seat of a student this time. So uh, welcome back to Making Sense Conversations. Um, if you've been joining us uh, for the last couple of weeks, welcome back. So glad to have all of you. Um, and uh, let us again know where it is you're, you're tuning in from. So even as we speak, we have context of where, where people are coming from. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to our community. Welcome to our movement. And Making Sense is really, this Making Sense Conversations is a platform to build and encourage financial empowerment. It's actually a move for financial empowerment. And it's, it's so vast. The topic of financial empowerment is so vast. And we are always here to have thought-provoking and authentic conversation about money, about life, about our businesses, all with the objective of us being able to create wealth for ourselves, create wealth for our communities, create wealth from our nations. We draw a lot from the principles in my book, Making Sense. If you've, I know a lot of you have read the book. Uh, those of you who haven't read the book will tell you where to be to get the book after this. Uh, welcome, Abdi, who's, call, who's from Seattle. Welcome, Abdi. Yeah? Um, and thank you for joining us once again. So... One of the things we do is we have people from London. Ken, as you, I hope you can see how global our community on Making Sense is. Um, I know we have people from across Africa as well, from Kenya. So guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. Today, we are, one of the things we do in Making Sense is, even as we encourage ourselves to be financially empowered, we are bringing issues and and down to the level of human beings. And that's why we do this through conversation again. And we want to bridge the gap between those things that are out there for only certain people with certain degrees, with certain positions should know, and understand how are they, how are they relatable to us, yeah? And today's topic is one of those. And I know for me, I, I have uh, approached this topic of the economy, Wondering what is this economy? Um, is it for the central bank governor? Is it for our leaders? For those guys with those jobs, yeah, to talk about something and they come up with words like GDP, fiscal policy, demand, supply, money. But we never talk about what does it mean for me? And especially now when we are hearing so much about economy, 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 economy is growing, economy is shrinking, COVID has done this to the economy. We've got to understand there's this, it's like there's this balloon, yeah, called the economy. And then we are the players in the balloon, but we don't understand how the balloon operates. So we are part of this economy and, and this actual balloon. And that's a conversation I want us to have today. And before I introduce Ken, I just want to say, and those of you who've joined me from before, you keep, I, I've kept told you before, my inspiration this season is David and Goliath. And the, the inspiration I keep taking from David is that David beat Goliath with weapons that were underestimated. It was a slingshot and stones. He was much smaller than Goliath, but he beat them. And Ken, I've been feeling this is the season for the David. It's those things that we underestimate that are going to get us to the next level. It's not about looking like a Goliath or pretending to be Goliath or even trying to know what Goliath knows. But I, and I think... I, we really, really underestimate what is right in front of us, yeah? So today we are here to understand, how do, what does this word economy mean to you? And this conversation is going to cut across whether you're in business, whether you're employed, whether you're a stay-at-home, whether you're a student in transition, whether you're looking, whether you're retired, we are all connected. And I think I, I have found, and um, I don't know if all of you have realized, in this season, I've realized how we are all connected. When you lose your source of income, that means you can't go to, to the fruits and vegetables uh, shop, which may be my business. That means your employees cannot go there. So it, it affects me. So we are all connected. COVID made us realize if I touch you, yeah, if I, if I shake your hand, I can get infected, yeah? So we are so connected, but we've, we've lived very disconnected lives. Like it's just me, this, all these other bigger things um, are not relatable to me and we don't look our, at our context. We are also, we've called it language of the new economy because we have to figure out how do we translate 
what is going on in the economy to how we reinvent ourselves. And we've got to st start building a sense of economic loyalty to our nations. So welcome everybody, Stephen Booker from Bungoma, welcome. And I just want to introduce Ken. Ken, I don't know what has happened with your camera. It has gone sideways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's better. That's better. Yes, yeah. So Ken is um, a friend of mine, and he's the first person I approached and said, Ken, please start telling me what economy means. And I had a couple of sessions with Ken that just completely made me understand. And he has the ability to talk economics in a way that is just so relatable. You won't even think he's understanding his... Um, He's, he's talking economics. Economics for some of us is something we crammed our way through in university just to pass, but we, we can't remember anything else. So Ken, welcome to Making Sense Conversations. Yeah, I am so happy to have you. And um, I'd like to you to tell us who you are and just break down what is happening in our economy. Why do we keep saying our economy is, is in problems? Welcome, Ken. Thank you so much, Washeke. Uh, I hope you can yes. hear me loud and yes, clear. Yes, can hear you very well. Yes. yes indeed. Um, once again, uh, it's such a pleasure to be part of your conversation. Uh, it's very exciting to discuss this topic. This is a topic I know you're very passionate about yeah, and yes. you've talked about it for many years. Well, uh, my name is Ken Gishinga and uh, I'm the Chief Economist at uh, Mentoria Economics. My work really is to provide uh, clients with a state of the economy outlook, really helping people unpack um, what's happening out there. Not everybody has the opportunity to read the news every day, watch the news every day. And that's essentially what we do as a team, just to try and gather as much and really try and formulate uh, meaningful insights on the economy. Uh, my background is in economics. I studied in economics. Uh, my first job was in Seattle, so I'm very happy to see there's somebody in there from yeah, Seattle. Seattle yes. I worked at Microsoft, and uh, when I came back to Kenya about a decade, and I've been a senior economist at uh, both um, Equity Bank and Commercial Bank of Africa, which is now NCBA. And uh, the last five years, I decided to create a home for economics. And that's when I created what I call Mentoria Economics because independence is a very important part of analyzing the economics. And I really felt economics needed a home where you could really discuss it from an independent mm. and from an unbiased perspective yeah. because it's very, very easy to have biases. Uh, and we all have biases and we'll talk about that later. And that's what we do okay. uh, for the last five years. Mm. Um, in terms of the state of the economy, uh, one of the things that we really have to appreciate is cash in circulation. That's possibly one of the most important indicators. And it shocks me how less of an attention it gets mm. um, among many economies because mm. uh, the economy is the grand sum of the activities between you and me and my mom and your mom and the mom's grocer, mm -hmm. my mom's grocer, net act collective activities. And all these are transactions that require cash to process. Yes. So the amount of cash in the economy is possibly the most in the important indicator of how well uh, the economy is doing. And I get surprised because this is an indicator that we've only started tracking the last five years. So it tells, it makes me wonder, you know, <laughs> How are we functioning before? Because yes. that is really the most important part. Uh, now, a very quick thing is last year, uh, the Central Bank of Kenya retired the old 1,000 shilling note. Mm. And uh, that was on Madaraka Day last year. And that had a very big impact on the economy. It took out about 70 billion shillings uh, out of the economy. Mm. So we went to about from about 222 billion shillings uh, down to almost 170, 60 billion shillings. And that's why for a lot of people last year was um, quite a tough year uh, because of that. Um, September was the lowest point, but from then on we started seeing a recovery. And we saw recovery, we saw money in circulation yeah. going to 
180, 190. We almost touched even 200 billion shillings before COVID came. Yeah. And COVID really created now a lot of confusion. So what we are seeing right now is people are choosing to hold on money right now because of all the uncertainties that uh, is taking place out there. Uh, people who might have wanted to purchase a house or a car mm. are postponing those decisions and they're keeping that money um, in the bank accounts. So we are seeing very little transactions mm. in the economy and uh, businesses thrive on transactions. So mm. when you have reduced economic activity, we see businesses closing, we see jobs uh, being lost. And really that's where we are as of today, July 24th, where uh, we don't know what if you're going to have another lockdown. I know yeah. the president is having a meeting with the governors, but that uncertainty is really uh, the main, the main uh, uh, reason why the economy is not doing very well right now. And, and you know, can you've answered something? Because when we, all this happened, and I think this is across the many nations, I'm like, yes, we're saying we don't have money, but there was no big bonfire where we lit a fire, a match to the money. Uh, we did not say the money has gotten coronavirus. So what you're telling us is the money is basically locked in people's accounts. When people went into survival mode, they're, because when I buy a car, just so that, I guess this is what you, economists call money supply in, in some way. When I buy a car, I go pay my car dealer that money. That car, my car dealer then goes and feeds his family. My car dealer pays his employees. The employees pay school fees. So just by my one transaction of buying a car, yeah, let's say I bought a car for $5,000 or 500,000 shillings, it has gone and spread into very many sources. Those employees go to the green grocer or to the mamamboga and buy vegetables and fruits. Uh, over the weekend, they go and buy chicken and chips from KFC. So you're saying it is that... It is that now, instead of that, it has just stayed in a bank account. It's, so that is what is causing us not to move. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you've put it very well. In fact, I keep telling people, if you want to understand the economy, one of the best analogies is the human anatomy. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, blood essentially is what transports oxygen uh, yeah. around the body. Um, anytime uh, you, you, you don't have enough blood in your system, you're anemic yes. and you become very weak and you start struggling. Um, the human body is very, the economy is very similar to that where cash really is the blood flow um, of, um, of, of the system. So when people start um, keeping money in their fixed deposits, uh, saving, and saving yeah. is a good thing, people sort of stop spending and they really start holding uh, those transactions that you've talked about, that money multiplier effect, where you pay your house help, your yes. house help goes and buys a uh, vegetables, a yes. household, yes. that multiplier effect stops happening. And essentially, that becomes the big problem uh, with the economy. And that's what's happening right now. And that happens in every economy in the world where there's no clear uncertainty uh, certainty about the future. And that's why the central bank um, very frequently does perceptions on the economy. They do uh, outlooks and they ask CEOs and business leaders, what's your outlook for the next six months? What's your outlook for inflation? Okay. Yeah. What's your outlook? Because if people have a negative outlook on the future, they will not spend, they will postpone investments, they will postpone purchases, and that has a very negative effect on the economy. And, 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 and it's unfortunate, Ken, because all of, the, all of us who are putting money in the bank accounts, we've kept them with the bank, yeah? And typically in, in a place, time when people are more confident of the economy, what the bank then does with that money is lend it, yeah? So even if I have a fixed deposit, I put my one million in fixed deposit, uh, typically what the bank has done with that one million is go and lend it to a business which keeps the one million in circulation, even though records show it is my fixed deposit, yeah? But now, can I think our problem is also being caused by the banks also not having confidence, they are not lending, yeah? So they are not putting that money back in circulation in the economy. So, 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 so Ken, so now we are here, and all of us are here, the people listening to here, they are, 
there are some are employed, some are in business, some are in transition, some are looking for a job. And when you're speaking, I'm getting an aha moment, yeah? So whether you're in a job or running a business or looking for a job, it all happens fundamentally behind the scenes because somebody has decided to move money. If I hire you and I'm paying you a salary, I have decided to move that money from somewhere and pay you. If I buy goods and services in your business, I have decided to move for money, money from somewhere and pay you. Um, the employer has decided to spend on you for a reason. So we've got to start understanding in this crunch of survival mode. I guess that is where the, us, our, I think everybody at this time has to think and innovatively and as, as an entrepreneur, we are all now in the game of, in this new environment, what are the new motivators for money to move? Yeah. Um, how do we get people to move money? I don't know, is that a correct analogy? Now, how we have to think, because we have to move our lives forward is, how do I get people to move money? Is that the question all of us should be asking ourselves? Not just about starting a business or being in a job. What value am I providing so that people are encouraged, even in this time? or inspired to move money yes indeed that is the most important question that our policy makers and all of us have to answer and we all have a role in it uh, not to get too technical i'd like to introduce the two branches of economics here yeah, yeah. Uh, what we call fiscal policy this is really about government and government and the public sector and monetary policy this is about commercial banks and uh, uh, private businesses mm. uh, because there are two avenues in which money enters into an economy number one is through government spending so government investing in roads in uh, railways uh, uh, that money yeah. being pumped into projects that's what you'll hear a lot of economists call fiscal policy then you have uh, the monetary policy this is about commercial banks and which are lending to private businesses now in economics is a very big debate around which is a more powerful arm um, but i've always maintained that monetary policy because that is where the private sector gets cash and i've always mm. argued that the private sector is the engine that creates wealth and prosperity from any country so in as much as uh, government spending and we've seen a lot of government spending on projects being there uh, yeah. It has its problems. In fact, yeah. on the business daily today, they talk about the World Bank saying projects within uh, the Kibaki era have become white elephants. Yeah. And that's a big, big, big problem. Uh, I've always been a big ad uh, advocate for monetary policy. Are banks lending money to private businesses? and our businesses being able to use that money to wisely to invest yeah. to create growth and to create opportunity so back to your question on where do we all come in into this yeah well if you're a, if you're a businessman it's really really about your relationship for example with your bank yeah. you know and right now i know banks have given some moratoriums uh on on bank loans and some of those moratoriums have already even expired and people are trying to ask, can we get more moratoriums? Mm, mm. Businesses are trying to negotiate with their landlords uh, to be able to get sort of more relief. And that's why the private sector conversation has been, has been most involved. But you're absolutely right. When you talk about the whole economy, it's about what is the government doing mm. in terms of a stimulus package? Mm. Number two, what is the private sector, the business more, uh, member organizations, what are they doing uh, in terms of changing the business models? And number three, it's really about commercial banks being able to churn that liquidity into the system. Now, what you talked about, connecting the savers and the borrowers is yes. what banks do. And that wow. process is called intermediation, where you borrow from Washeke and you create loans for Ken. In fact, Alan, uh, one of our viewers today, Alan Collins, has said customer deposits to the bank go a liabilities and then they give them out and then they become assets. So I think it's exactly what you've said. So Alan, I think Ken, Ken has agreed with that point. Yeah. Completely. But the yeah. problem is what's happening right now is banks have reduced their lending, their lending. to businesses. They are essentially right now, banks are spending more 
investing in purchasing government security, purchasing uh, government bonds, purchasing government bills, because they're very scared that businesses right now are not doing well. And banks do are very yeah. scared of non-performing loans. Yeah. Right now, the non-performing loans in the banking sector in Kenya, it's at its highest since August 2007. That's about 13 years. So banks right now are very scared about lending to businesses because they don't know whether that money will um, come back to them. So that's the problem we have right now. And for me, I think the solution starts with, first of all, the government giving an exit strategy. The government has to come up with what is called an exit strategy. And this is what's happening in many countries in Europe where they give guidance. And mm. uh, I'm glad in terms of movement, we've gotten guidance. International airport will open on uh, August, August 1st. 1st. So at least hotels can start preparing uh, for international clients. But there are many other sectors that have not received that kind of specific guidance. You know, last week you saw the cinemas uh, shutting down. Yes. Um, 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 we are seeing manufacturing also struggling. So I think one of the best things government can do is to give guidance sector by sector. This will be the way forward. And that's what we are seeing in countries such as in the UK, where they do sector by sector guidance. Okay. Now, based on that guidance, the business, what I call the BMOs, business member organizations, let's say in hospitality, mm. they should call their members and say as hotels, this will be the new business models. Mm. We're going to talk to our banks right now to give us another moratorium on the bank uh, loans. We're going to talk to the landlords to maybe give us another three months relief. Then banks now can be able to start lending because banks cannot lend to a hotel that's not operating. Yes. You know, it does not make sense. So, it, as you say, it requires a collaboration of all these three entities for this to be a meaningful um, a recovery. And, and us as, um, as, as individuals, the individual consumer, the individual customer, I think, because uh, even we said, and there's a Virginia is commenting that economy is means money movement. And I think in a very general sense, that is correct. We are all being affected by how the money is moving in the economy. Doesn't also our personal responsibility. So there's a lot of things that government and these uh, member organizations need to do. But does our personal responsibility also, first of all, become an innovation? Yeah. Uh, because Ken, I think we've also seen a lot of us so stuck to the way we were doing things. If I had a restaurant and it ran like this, I am waiting for the government to finish this perfect uh, policy and environment and corona, so I'm not going to do anything. But now that we understand money is locked, yeah? Um, so if you want to put food on your table, you have to become over and above, go over and above in innovation to get money moving. And I think we can use this example in Kenya where we've seen the boot vegetable business where people have been, even with their BMWs or their Matatus or whatever cars they have, just up my road, we have almost like a new market that has started because there are so many put. These were people who are doing, who are doing jobs somewhere else. Now they're not earning money, but they have found a way in the meantime, let me go buy vegetables, go to these neighborhoods. People are not going to the market. So this is where they will spend money in buying their fruits and vegetables. So just taking that as an example, and that's not to say that everybody should do boot vegetable business because especially Kenyans, we like that thing of if everybody is doing it, we're all going to do it. But do our minds have to now work, have to work differently so that we start understanding that the other side of the economy is also there are problems that need to be solved, Yeah. So even in, this, in, even in this, where the old economy, money was not moving the way it was when pre-March. But now, what are the new things that will get money to move, like vegetable businesses, for example, like delivery businesses, for example? Is that how we, even on an individual level, that we can start taking responsibility? Even if you have a job, it's to start understanding what is the new thing with my job, yeah? Indeed, personal responsibility is everything. And there are two phases of personal responsibility. Yeah. Number one first is a character part. And I'm going to yeah. talk about that. Yeah. And number two, there is the innovative part. Yeah. On the character part, uh, one of the things that uh, I was talking to a banker um, a couple of weeks ago, 
And he told me when banks started giving people moratoriums mm. on their loan, mm. the, the people who their economic conditions had not changed mm. at all ended up paying, taking up those moratoriums. They ended up not paying their uh, monthly installments, even though the economic condition had not been affected. Now, yeah. that's what we call a mo moral failure. Because, absolutely, absolutely. Because, because if you're not able to pay the bank and you are in a position where you're able to, it means that bank does not have the funds to be able to give it to, to, somebody, give to somebody who else. Who really needs. So that, what, that's what we call moral failure. And character, and I know you're passionate about character, that's one part. So let me, let me, before you move on to innovative, I want to talk to those people who may be doing that, yeah? And just put it into context with what Ken has been saying. If you can afford, yeah, to pay the bank, to pay your employees, to pay your house help, all those things that we're calling character, because we know coronavirus created this grand excuse for everybody to use, which is undisputable. But if you honestly, when you go to bed at night, know you can afford to do it, do it because the economy needs you to keep doing it, to keep money moving and not enter the bandwagon of, my, where, of people where money is actually not moving. So back to Ken, if you can afford to pay your loan, it is unfair for you to take the moratorium whilst, because it will deny somebody else who really needs it, that moratorium, because the bank can only give moratorium to a fixed number of people. Yeah? So that's very important that we do have to moral, some, the one that nobody is going to tell you, but you know. Thank you, Ken. Indeed, yeah. Right. yeah. And, and and econ in economics, the word we have for that is called the free rider effect. Yeah. Where yeah. you sort of like a ride on to something. For example, if you lived in an apartment complex of 20 people and half of those people have lost their jobs and they go to, and they say they are not able to pay rent, you find somebody who is able to pay rent. Yes, yes. Jumps onto that and really free rides. It's called a free rider effect. And it really, it's, 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 an, it's, 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 it's a result of what is called information asymmetry because the landlord and the bank sometimes can't tell who has lost their job, mm. who has lost their business. And that's what you're finding a lot of landlords and banks are saying, give us proof that you've actually been laid off. Give us proof yes. that you really can. And that's quite unfortunate because it shows there's a trust deficit uh, between uh, the two parties. And that's, that's that. The second part is the innovative Innovation. part. Innovation, yes. That's really your ability to um, think broadly, think deeply, and think widely mm. um, about opportunities in the market. Um, it's not something that is cultivated overnight, but it's something that if you have the values of a student, and I like the video that you released as a build-up to this. You talked yeah. about... The, stu uh, the life, a student of life. A student if of you life, yes. The, if you have the virtues of a student, and that is uh, you're humble, uh, you're open to new ideas, and you're open to learning. Some people have those traits more than others. Yes. And those people sometimes tend to be more innovative. And that's really thinking about asking yourself, in my community here, uh, do I have resources of things that I can be able to sustain uh -huh. myself? Mm. I, I have a neighbor here mm. who has started a peanut butter business, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and, coming and she's supplying it to the neighbors here mm -hmm. and mm. the neighbors love it because it's, 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 it's local and it's, it's, it's organic and it's good. So I think it's that idea of, you know, I'm resourceful and I have gifts, uh, yes. but how do I make the most out of this? So it's, as I said, different, like creativity, different people have it to, different extents, but I think everybody can improve their innovativeness. Uh, one, by op being open to new ideas. Number two, by reading about the world and yeah. the state of the world. And number three, by being involved in affairs of the community or affairs really of your family or affairs of the world. I think those three recipes open you up to new ideas and obviously the value of mentors. Having mentors you can talk to about various uh, ideas. I think all these things come together to create an innovative human being. Okay. I think you mentioned two things that Ken have also, I've also done, put in the book as well. Uh, innovative and putting yourself in an inno innovative space. Can I always tell people, avoid the poverty support group. 
And that's uh, the group that is going to be all about all the economy, all the president, all the leaders, all, and make yourself a victim so that you give yourself an excuse for doing nothing. So we all have to ditch the poverty support group. If you are the chair of the poverty support group, please resign and just start having a different conversation because I think it's these type of conversations and conversations around us with people who are thinking in this direction that will help you understand what the next, uh, the next move is. And I like that thing of start... I think we all have to go into multiplication and understand, yes, this is the one job I do, but I think, Ken, what has op uh, we have all learned from this is multiple streams of income are important. So even if you have a job, yeah, what can you do? Can you bake? Can you cook? Can you write? Can you create? And that's where innovation comes from because people all sometimes think innovation is just about creating an app or the next digital something. We understand digital is important, but I think we sit on what I, I call in making sense, non-financial assets, and we don't actually... We don't, we don't actually use them. Can I think another thing that stops people is these lofty ideas, stops us as individuals and also stops us as governments. Um, I know there was something you and I were laughing about yesterday <laughs> about these lofty plans, yeah? And uh, we did see a tweet about how some manufacturing of vehicles in a certain county in Kenya, and we were asking ourselves, is that the best use of resources? Are we thinking too lofty? Whilst, you know, how about just making t-shirts, <laughs> you know, the locally produced t-shirts, yeah? So can, as an economy, whether it's individual or, or um, on, the, on, the, on the macro side, the people who are making the macro decisions, are we stuck in lofty pie-in-the-sky ideas? Well, I think uh, first I saw Emily making fun of that poverty support. <laughs> Yeah. You make. And I think it ties back to a conversation we had almost two years ago yeah. about the two types of mindsets. There's a mindset of scarcity and the mindset of abundance. Abundance, yes. And those are two people in the same station in life, in the same company, doing the same job, can have yeah. two fundamentally different outlooks on life. One person will think of everything as scarce and will really try to conserve and yeah. not give. Yeah. And somebody who has an abundant mindset really thinks, um, yes, there's really an, an abundance of opportunity. So that fundamental mindset is really what separates, mm. as you say, uh, especially entrepreneurs, but even more uh, generally, uh, employees and um, the citizens um, of this country. Number two is, obviously, when you have that mindset of abundance, you're able now to start uh, being open to new ideas. And for me, I, I think being open to new ideas is one of the most difficult mm. things that most people have because we are habits of, we are creatures of habit. Yeah. You know, we say we were taught this this way, so it should always be the way we were taught. For example, in economics, one of the areas I really struggle with, especially with older economists, is the issue of mobile money. Mm. Um, I've always argued that mobile money uh, n n even needs to be considered when you're thinking about monetary policy because so much money moves through M-Pesa and such likes. But sometimes you find, sometimes, um, uh, especially the older economies, they struggle with this because it was never in the textbooks. There was no chapter when they were in university on mobile money mm. and how can mobile money become part of a monetary policy. In fact, nowadays I see in Kenya, more money moves through mobile money than through bank accounts nowadays. So you find there are people who struggle because it was never taught to them that way. So they, they can't envision that life. So I think being open to new ideas is definitely a big part. I think on the issue of whether we should have lofty ideas or whether we should not, mm. uh, we should sort of start small. Um, I've always said... Uh, Think about your competitive advantage. advantage. Yeah. That is one of the most important concepts in economics and mm. in strategy. What, mm. uh, as Washeke, is your competitive advantage? What, as Ken, is your competitive advantage? In fact, because Ken, in Kenya, in fact, Ken, sorry, let me interrupt you for that. You told me while we were having our discussions a while ago, competitive advantage is focusing on your key strengths that you have that the market doesn't have. Is that, that correct? Yeah. 
You said it yeah. very, very well. Yeah. Because yeah. in Kenya, we have the copy-paste mindset. Yes. I yes. see you doing this business. I want to enter that business because uh, because you're successful. And I think that's, uh, uh, it, that's the reason why we struggle in business. We don't focus on our strengths so much as uh, we don't do a lot of introspection. We don't do enough soul searching to be able to ask ourselves, what are the gifts, the unique yeah. gifts that I have that help me communicate this message better? I think if especially entrepreneurs can focus on that, because in Kenya, we have that copy paste mindset. Remember the whole, um, uh, and that's why you have this scheme. Remember that whole business syndicate around, uh, were, they, were they chicken or something? Yes, 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 yes. Getting them and yes, nobody even yes. understood why. They just yeah. it, it, it makes money, and that's a, that's one of the challenges we have in Kenya. So I think as a county, and I remember we were looking at that county yesterday, and we identified that county is very good in agriculture and in tourism, mm. and we were asking ourselves, why? <laughs> why why are you they <laughs> on, on <things> cars? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not against that effort but yeah. i'm just saying are you playing to your greatest strength you know they'll always tell you play to your greatest Just strength strength yeah and your best use of resources at that time because the investment in car and manufacturing if they put it towards agriculture it would have the the you know we keep saying it's about multiplication more now they would get their return on investment or see that multiplication a lot more can even as we become innovative um in our own countries yeah i'm also looking at the role of our, ourselves as consumers and um i went to the supermarket the other day and you know before at this time i would not have thought i just pick toothpicks they look good and i, and I move on but that day in the supermarket i paused and i was like there's toothpicks made in china and the thing is the china they make them look in all these nice fancy containers so they look nice and pretty so your eye is instantly appealed but then i was like there's this other toothpicks in kenya and that day i made a decision toothpicks i'm gonna buy toothpicks made in kenya i probably never realized i was buying toothpicks made in china before because when i buy the toothpicks made in china it supports that business that supports those employees yeah who earn money who'll go buy vegetables who'll come and spend money in my business and then my child goes to school so when i start saying we are all connected is, isn't it time to really rise and say, buy Kenya, buy Africa? Because um, otherwise we're going to become the continent of consumption versus the continent of uh, production. Yeah. And even us as consumers, maybe what we can do in our own little way, and maybe we now start a movement of this, is where we can see our country could have a competitive advantage. Yeah or that we don't need, you know, toothpicks, you really, we don't need to be buying that from other countries. We're not saying we're going to go and make everything and never buy anything made in another country, but where you're putting your own country at a, at a competitive disadvantage, shouldn't we now be, be more conscious and become economic loyalty, loyalists, so to speak. We become economically loyal to our own and also not, not, uh, not bad mouth. You know, I, over time people have been, we, we grew up with this mindset that the better things are from abroad or the better things are from other, other nations. Is this, does our role as consumers also come into play in making our economy work? It certainly does. And I call that enlightened consumption. Enlightened, enlightened consumption. Guys, I hope you and heard that. Enlightened, long, <laughs> enlightened consumption. Yeah. And, and indeed, in fact, one of the very good books that talks about this is called Small is Beautiful. Yeah. And it really advocates for um, small scale supply chains yeah. and being able to maximize what's within uh, your vicinity. Yeah. In fact, at some point, it was a big movement. I know, like in the US, at some point, it was very fancy to go to a restaurant where everything was sourced from the local Thank farmers yes. and, and local produce. And I think it's a fantastic thing. And yeah. it's, it, it can really support producers. I think that the biggest challenge with that, and I do know most Kenyans are loyal and most Kenyans do want to support local yes. businesses. I think the issue has been around price. price. And Kenyans are among the most price sensitive people in this world. 
So if you create a product, and this is now a challenge to the businesses, especially yes. how can you create your product to be able to compete effectively on price? How can you show cost leadership in terms of competing with price? Because most Kenyans, if something is like for like, they'll definitely go for the uh, the, the, the the local one if possible. But the challenge you have is sometimes the difference in price between the local option and the foreign option, especially with China coming in and yeah. really taking prices to beyond zero. I think that's where a lot of people struggle. And you see it even in the cloth outfit space. You know, a lady will say, I want to get a nice outfit from a Kenyan designer, but if that's going to cost me 4,000 shillings, but I can go to toy here and get it for yeah. 500 shillings, that, yeah. that becomes the big challenge. So the question is, how can the government assist local producers to be able to produce at a cheaper price. And one of the big challenges is around the cost of energy, especially in manufacturing, uh, because yeah. the cost of energy is quite high. The cost of uh, bank loans are quite high. And sometimes that's why you find local products tend to be higher because they are paying a higher interest rate on their loans. They are paying high prices on energy. They are paying uh, that stuff. So I think if the government can come with policies to make the cost of doing business much lower, you'll be able to see businesses also reducing their prices mm. to be able to be more, more competitive. I have no doubt that if we can become price competitive, most Kenyans definitely want to support local businesses. And also as consumers, in, even as we make that move where the bigger issues like uh, cost of energy can be brought down and the policies can favor uh, local uh, local manufacturers, local farmers, even even PB through things through even if it's like things like taxes on, on goods that are coming from out of the country. In the in the spirit of enlightened consumption as you've called it, sometimes question why is something more expensive? See this mug. Yeah, this mug. Bought it. Uh, maybe a couple of months ago, made in China. Can you see it does has no handle. It I don't know if you can, guys can see it properly it has chipped. Yeah. Cost of this mug, 150 bob. Yeah, it's those prices that just don't make you think, yeah? Cost of this mug, yes, 400 bob. So everyone from out of the country, that's $4. This is one, one and a half dollars. What this, but though three years ago, can you see this beautiful mug? Four years ago, not a chip in sight. This mug has fallen down so many times and the handle is still intact. Made proudly in Kenya, Yeah. So even sometimes, this has not even lasted one year, yeah? So I'd have to buy four of these, which will end up being more expensive than one of those. So in the spirit of enlightened consumption, let's also question, let's not have myopia, short-sightedness about this, and let's go into also the conversation of quality versus quantity. Because sometimes we buy many clothes because we want to have many clothes, but then we have to keep, we have to keep buying them all the time. So Alan is even saying we've got to start being proud of our own stuff. He felt, feels ashamed foreigners know more about Kenyan tea and coffee than me. Even I go abroad sometimes and you see they know more about your coffee than you. I met somebody who like he comes to Kenya to collect art. And I was so embarrassed at that time. I've not collected my Kenyan art. And uh, can I want to answer a couple of questions during this time? Um, as we are now going into this new economy, the way the new economy works, what we've been talking about today, how would the circles come in? Grace is asking, how would a circle be utilized to, to plug into this? Well, definitely circles have been a major engine for growth in Kenya. A lot of people uh, have bought their first property, their piece of land, on circles. I think circles have really, really what have transport, uh, transformed land ownership and house ownership. So they definitely play an important role. I would like to see more stronger corporate governance around circles. I think one of the challenges most circles have is around just having strong governance structures that can be able to, to sustain it. But for most Kenyans, uh, definitely the circles is uh, the, the, the main avenue for growth. It's access to credit. And as I said earlier, credit is really what, what drives um, the economy. I think um, from a broader perspective, and I like what you talked about um, and building on that idea of enlightened consumption, 
you know, one of the things that uh, South Africa did some time back was the whole proudly South African logo. Mm, it was mm. really about identifying things that are locally produced and being able to put that nice um, tick that mm. sort of made that that. I think if the likes of Brand Kenya can be able to even create an online marketplace for locally cons- produced goods and give a logo, these are things that are well made in Kenya. Their standards are very, they're world class. I think a lot of people are looking for those kind of things. Just they don't know where to find them. I think if an innovative entrepreneur came up with a marketplace for locally cons- uh, produced goods, I think it would be a, a, yeah. a, 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 a huge hit. And I like that, that you said, uh, if someone came up with a place where people can go with their local made good services, their crafts, but one place where people can actually find them, I think you'd find traffic. And that leads back to innovation. And we're, when we're wondering what is our role in solving our problems going forward, is that we stop thinking that it takes, it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be the person making the mugs. This is where the new opportunities are, Yeah. Uh, so there's that person who they are, their gift, their competitive advantage as an individual, as a business is making this. It doesn't mean you go and copy and start making mugs, but you could be the person because of your networks or your experiences or your skills that you have the ability to create the marketplace, even digitally, yeah, for Kenyans to come together and buy locally made products. So I think Ken, what, what, what uh, the light bulb that has gone on in my mind as you speak is that We've got to stop looking at opportunity. We've got to start looking at opportunity differently, and it's not the same way it has presented itself. You could make the goods or provide the service. You could also provide the communication. You could provide the marketplace. So the opportunities are are so are so are so big. Um, there's someone who's commented, and I think it's a conversation we've had with you. Alan has commented that COVID has made people open their eyes because when we, they wanted KQ to repatriate Kenyans, Kenyans wanted to fly Emirates, yeah? And, <laughs> and you know, it was, <laughs> it was a conversation we were having to, uh, yesterday that even these, especially these bigger businesses, and I know a lot of Kenyans have wanted want to fly KQ, have wanted to fly KQ, but when they look at the gap in price, yeah? So there's a level, even as, as much as we are by Kenya, by Africa, there's a level that, hey, a $500, $600 difference in a price ticket, yeah? So what do companies and people, companies like KQ have to do? But also us, as we grow our own businesses, what do we have to be careful about? About which trap shouldn't we get into? Even as we're waiting for the government to sort itself out, yeah? Mm. Well, in the economy, there are always two sides to the economy. There's a supply side and, and there's demand. the demand side. Yeah. So the demand is uh, the you and I, the consumers, um, the enlightened consumers, as we'd like to have it. On the supply side is uh, your KQs, uh, your big multinationals that yeah. are trying to, to, to turn a profit and they face a whole different set of circumstances. And where supply and demand meet, that's always called the market price. Okay. And sometimes that price works for some people, but it's called the equilibrium price for that. Mm. Uh, what I've always argued is companies need to think innovatively about reducing costs. Um, some companies, for example, in Kenya, have come to realize, you know, we can actually work from home. We don't need to have a whole uh, entire floor office space to be able to yes. conduct our business. Yes. So that money, that 100000 they were probably saving in rent, yeah. they can put it to research and development and really think about the next big thing in their industry around innovation. Mm. So I think, you know, and a lot of people ask, what's my role in this whole space of uh, innovation? How do I plug in? And I keep saying one of the quickest and easiest areas is to ask yourself, what are the big things that Kenya exports? You know, Mm. what are the main, the top 10 products that Kenya, uh, sorry, imports Mm. into, into the country? And can I, in one of those 10 or 20 items, do I have a particular skill where I can locally produce it at a a competitive fee? Because if you're importing these things, it means there's a local demand for those, uh, for those um, items. So yeah. how can I apply that same thing using locally sourced uh, raw material and be able to service that need for the client? Because 
for me it becomes a business and for the end client it becomes a cheaper uh, a cheaper input to what they are trying to do so i think that's one of the big areas understanding what's the demand what mm. what are people looking for what are people craving for and how using my talents and skills can i fit fill that demand using a very innovative um, approach to, to 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 the market and i think people who take that line of thought tend to do much better when it comes to innovation so this new economy of ours just to is is and that demand supply you've just told us is just back to what problem can i solve and and even better uniquely positioned to solve yeah um and so that whether i'm an individual looking for a job or a business i have to now go out there because the problems are diff some of the problems are different yeah um so my problem is not going out to a restaurant anymore but my problem may be i still want meals maybe i want home cooked meals so that that's a new problem that can be solved so where we have to exit poverty support group and enter problem solving group or wealth creation group like i like to call it to start understanding yes we have a government that has many things to get together but we will die of starvation if we wait yeah what problem um I solving so whether you're kq or whether you're a startup business you have to start we have to just start um asking that St uh, steven at Buira is asking investment opportunities and savings options factoring economic performance and there's someone who had even asked earlier your uh, i said something about a hundred a report from the standard media that a hundred billion is being kept in banks personal savings and bank accounts what's the impact of that and even now understanding that we are part of the economy how do we look at investment opportunities and savings well let me start with your first part about really understanding the problem yeah. because where people see problems and entrepreneur sees solutions and he sees business he yes. sees profit yes and so it means we really have to be part of a community or something either within yeah. your family network mm. you know either within your your WhatsApp community for your apartment. Mm, mm. Sometimes you just listen to people complaining yeah. about various things. You know, uh, our internet is terrible. Our yes. showers are terrible. All these things that look like problems mm. to an innovative person, they should be like, "Wow, there is a need for this. Mm. Can I come up with a solution?" If everybody in my neighborhood is complaining about maybe our internet or something, yes. can I start thinking about a new approach to ISP, internet service providing, mm. because clearly uh, the market is not filling, fulfilling the need of the people. If everybody is complaining about uh, the price of something, so I think, and that goes back to what you talk about, the mindset of abundance and scarcity. Yes. The person who has abundance, he sees problems as an opportunity to turn the conversation into providing a business with a need. I think the big challenge we have with our young entrepreneurs nowadays is they create their own problem, then they try to, to solve it. And so that they're, they're, they're their only customer. <laughs> exactly. And I always see young kids coming up with amazing apps, uh, but those... Can you you're on mute here. Yeah. Those apps really are not feeling any particular need in the market. So I think mm. that has to, it tells you that the entrepreneur needs to be part of people and part of communities so that you can listen to what people, and that's why I keep saying things like reading, reading the newspapers, mm. reading the news, listening to your family members. Anytime you hear somebody complaining, you should ask yourself, wow, it means there could be something here to, mm. to, to solve. That might be the next big thing that everybody uh, you know is, yeah. is looking for you know and we talked about businesses being able to meet kenyans at the right price point and i love what balala the cs balala told uh the masai mara hotels uh, because right now they don't have any international yes tourists. yes we told them you have to try and attract kenyans and domestic, domestic tourists and i'm sure there are many people on this group who are kenyans and have never been um to masai mara but he told them Kenyans will not come if you're charging three hundred dollars at yeah, night. Yeah. Because well, they rather use that three hundred dollars to go to Dubai mm. than to come to Masai Mara. So you need to come up with a price point mm. that the 
Kenyan has to be able to work with. So you need to understand Kenyan incomes. You need to understand how much Kenyans like to spend on leisure. So that part of research is really what our businesses should be doing to come up with a very, very good price point for, 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 end, for end producers. Okay, I'll just take one last question from Jeff. He wants insights on how employees should use their severance. But let me, do, let me give him my two cents first. I don't think following the conversation we've had with Ken, the question is how to use your severance, yeah? Because when we go approach it that way, I have this lump of money, then my, when I, it's about I need to use it, the question is what problem are you solving? How are you generating? If it's about I need another source of income, then how are you generating another source of income? What is your unique competitive advantage? So whether you're going to go out and look for a job or start a business, what am I going to do? Then if money needs to be invested in that, you'll have thought about it that way rather than the objective is not to use your severance. The objective is to place yourself in a position where you can solve a problem by you using your unique strengths yeah or unique skills and unique experiences and hopefully something you're passionate about ken what's your take on that i completely agree you yeah. really have to understand what's the big picture yeah and in terms of that severance i would not spend a penny before mm. i have a good understanding of what i want to do and this is where people like business mentors or people yeah. who come in the idea is think of a concept talk to one two three four five the problem we have in kenya is we yeah. hate talking about our business ideas because we believe somebody will steal them yes <laughs> that's always a big so we want to keep it to ourselves and wait for this aha surprise moment hey washeke yes. <laughs> this is my business yeah and for me, it doesn't work like that what you mm. need to do is look for trusted people in your network and say hey I'm thinking of starting an Airbnb in something. What are your experiences? Is it best in Westlands or is it best in Karen or is it best in Lovington? Talk to one, especially people who've been in business before. Yeah. Talk to trusted people, one, two, three, four. Then you start getting a sense of, for example, Airbnb seems, this, there seems to be a big demand for Airbnb in Spring Valley and nobody's yes. doing it now. So let me target it there. Yeah. But you have to have that idea that people want to help you. I think in Kenya, sometimes we are so suspicious. We feel, you know, if you open up your idea, somebody is going to come and steal it. Yes, and, yes, and yes. That's the power of having a trusted network. And it speaks to your friends. It speaks about the people you've created in your circle. If you obviously, if you've created people who are not trustworthy, then obviously your conclusion will be true. But there's an assumption that you have a trusted network of people who yeah. can advise you about, about that. And once you've had that concept not ready, then you can start investing some of that money into it. Far too often, I see people taking those severance packages, opening up an office, buying expensive furniture, but there is no business. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. coming in. Yeah. And in about yeah. six months, everything has wrapped up so the key question is what's the problem and is my approach to solving this problem um effective is it cost competitive and in this market where everybody's looking for better pricings can i compete if mm. you can check all those boxes absolutely go for it so just we've run out of time i know we could have continued this conversation even for another hour but I just want to sum up what we've been saying. We called today the language of the new economy. And as Ken has been speaking, I've just been taking some notes. So the language of the new economy, this is how we have to think. What is the value? Where is the demand? Where is the supply? Because now we've understood the economy in a nutshell is about money needs to be moving. So where, how am I, how am I creating value? or pitching value, or presenting myself as value, so money can move in my direction, in my business's direction, and I can put food in the table. It's about collaboration and community, your WhatsApp group, what are the problems you're seeing people complaining about? And uh, I think it's, it's someone who has said, uh, Kedan has said, greatest opportunities lie in what people are complaining about, yeah? We've got to, as a country, as a continent, start building economic loyalty to our own. Even as businesses, we have to work on 
how do we price better maybe uh, and the bigger infrastructure but it's about as a consumer your place is when i go into a shop can i buy kenya can i buy africa we are all in entrepreneurs now we are all in the innovation game in some way even if you're in a job if you're doing your job exactly the way it was being done three years ago there is a problem yeah so you've got to take your stand in how do i move this business forward how do i move my life forward it doesn't have to be lofty plans you know it's where is your competitive advantage where you are uniquely positioned and you have core, core competencies to be able to address that and then as i as i ch challenge people we are all in the business of multiplication so ken thank you so much for joining us today i don't know if you have a parting shot uh that you'd want to you'd want to give people before you before you leave well i think you've summarized it very well i like that part of collaboration yeah i think we need to create that attitude of collaboration having an open mind collaborating and really looking for solutions that can fix problems in our communities i think mm -hmm. if we can take that approach we can have the next uh, innovation revolution in kenya absolutely yeah uh i have always i'm just going to add on to that and i've always told people wealth creation is about multiplication how do i multiply my ideas how do i multiply my knowledge how do i multiply my networks and the best way to start is by starting so let's just start and let's now understand we are all part of this economy what you do affects somebody else. The choices you make affect somebody else and vice versa. So let's keep the bigger picture in mind. So we grow ourselves, yes, but we also grow our communities. We also grow our countries. We also grow our nations. So once again, thank you so much for joining us on Making Sense. Uh, you can get the book. Making Sense is now about your personal economics. And, uh, you know, the best place to start is starting from home where you understand even these things we've been talking about today, like non-financial assets. How does that come? We've gotten some questions on savings and investments. You learn a lot about that in the book. So you can get the book through directly at Centonomy. You can call the number on the screen or even go to our website and order it. And online on Amazon, we are on Amazon, so you can actually buy it. Thank you for those who have started leaving comments on Amazon, much appreciated. If you do get it through Amazon, please do leave us a review. Or in the bookshops, locally, also the bookshops here in Kenya at Yaya Center, Africa Book Hub, and, uh, and Prestige Bookshop. So once again, thank you for making sense. Next week, we will, we, will pro we will carry on in the same line of this discussion, but next week we are now even the new economy, a lot of opportunities are going to be created in the digital space. But many of us have not completely understood how to leverage on this digital space. So we have another guest with us next week coming to talk about the digital economy and how to think digitally all the way. So hope to see you. Please tell your friends, please tell your family, please tell your colleagues. Friday, 2 p.m., Making Sense Conversations, we shall continue. Ken, thank you so much for your time. And everybody who joined us today from all over the world, thank you, and we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Okay.